Good evening. Sorry about that. It's singing. Dries out your throat. Man, those were some beautiful songs. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, what is man that you're mindful of him? What are we? Why should you even care about us? You reign above the heavens, Lord. You are enthroned. And we are here scratching a living on planet Earth. And yet you love us deeply. Lord, you love us enough that you gave your only son so that you could be in a father-child relationship with us. This is beyond anything we can fathom or understand. Lord, the moment we think we, it makes sense to us and that, that we're worthy of that kind of love, correct our thinking. The moment we think that the gospel isn't as amazing as it is, that we think it's ordinary, forgive us and correct us. Lord, call to mind afresh and anew the wonders of what you have done for us. Impress it, Lord, not just on our minds but on our, our hearts that we, would, that we would be able to feel, Lord, the love that you have for us as displayed in the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, be with the preaching of your word tonight to accomplish that end, Lord, to convince us uh, of your goodness Convince us of your commitment to those who you have purchased with the blood of your Son. Open our eyes, Lord, to see wonderful, marvelous things from your word. We pray it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> well, in our study in Matthew chapter 5 right now of the Sermon on the Mount, we've come to a passage that is exceedingly difficult, even more difficult than anything we've, we've faced so far. And, uh, and as I was considering studying it, realizing that our pastor ha- has done a, I believe like a 12-part series on uh, the issue of divorce, marriage, remarriage, and adultery, uh, I, I thought it wisest, best to point you in that direction for that text, which is Matthew 5, I believe picking up in verse 31. And instead... Uh, I had a week to, to go elsewhere because uh, Blake next week is preaching on the next passage in that sermon, and so I had a, I had a choice to make on what to preach on, and, and about midway through the week, actually by su- Saturday night, I was just stumped after praying a lot about it and having these ideas running through my head of the things that God was gripping my heart on, yet not having any particular text jump out of me and grab me and say, this is where you're supposed to be, and I was, as I was praying about it, uh, Sunday morning, uh, the Lord put this verse into my mind. Uh, Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it up. And uh, I had not read that verse or that chapter in, in months, maybe even years. I have no idea where it came from, but I, it wouldn't let me go. And I mentioned it to Amber that morning, actually, as the offering plate was being passed. And uh, she said, well, that's, that's your text that you're supposed to preach on. But the problem was I didn't know what it meant, uh, nor did I know what, what book of the Bible it was even in. Just the verse had come to me. And so, uh, and so I looked it up, and it turns out it's in Psalm 81, and that's where we'll be tonight. Psalm 81, not just because it came to my mind, but because as I began to study it, the Lord began to show me what an amazing chapter it is. And so I pray that it, that it grips your heart the way that it's gripped mine this week. Psalm 81 will start in, in verse 1, and we're just going to dig right in. We're not going to read the whole thing first. It's 16 verses. We'll just take it one section at a time. The first one is verses 1 through 3, so let's read those together. It says, Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Raise a song. Sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre with the harp. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon on our feast day. Now, obviously, what we've got so far is a call to worship, right? Sing a song, play the instruments, the the stringed instruments, the tambourine, blow the trumpet. And specifically, 
Because we see that it's, it's at this full moon on our feast day in verse 3, this is probably a call to worship at the feast of Passover, right? At the Passover uh, celebration. And uh, there's some things in the context that are going to point that out too. The other option that it could be, the other time they would blow trumpets at the, at the full moon would be at the, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. So your, your Bibles may make a note that it could be either one of those, but I take it uh, and many other people as probably the Passover referring to here, Passover. And, and there's enough in these first three verses to preach a whole sermon on worship. Uh, if that was you know, where, the, where the heart of this psalm was, and that's where we could have stayed. Um, because, I mean, you can see, you know, it, it should, how easily an outline could come together, right? It should, be, it should be loud. It should be joyful. It should be uh, with a song, with sweet music. You could, you could definitely preach this. It should be everybody, right? Because in verse 1, that's, a, that's an appeal to the congregation. Everyone was supposed to sing. In verse 2, that's an appeal to the Levites, because they were the ones in charge of leading worship. That was the praise team, so to speak. And then in verse 3, that's probably specifically written to the priests who were the ones who were charged with blowing the trumpet at the Passover. And so you could talk about how everyone is to be involved. Uh, But I think that would miss actually the heart of this psalm, even though the main commandment is to worship God. And we'll be coming to that and we'll be seeing that throughout. uh, The reason for the worship and the motive behind that reason is really at the heart of this psalm. And so that's where we're going to spend most of our time. And the reason is, is restricted right there in verse 4. It's plainly given to us. right? So let's read verse 4. It says, For it is a statute for Israel, a rule of the God of Jacob. Why were these people to worship God? Why was the psalmist calling on them to celebrate the Passover? The Passover. I keep calling it Passover. To celebrate the Passover. It's because God had commanded it. That's a simple reason. That's what verse 4 says. It says it's a statute for Israel. It's a rule of the God of Jacob. God established it. God had commanded it. And if there was nothing else in this psalm, if it ended right there, a nice four-verse psalm, that would be enough. This would be a great psalm, right? A beautiful, impassioned call to worship in light of God's good command. But God, as he so often does, mercifully does, he goes on He doesn't just give the command. He knows that that it helps us, that it helps us to obey it when he gives us the reason why, when he gives us the motivation behind it. Isn't that merciful? Let's just stop and acknowledge, man, that's merciful. He doesn't have to do that. He's God. He can just say, worship me. That's all it takes. That's all it should take. But over and over again, we see he does this. It's a pattern of his. He mercifully tells us why. And the rest of this psalm is going to give the reason, or you can even say God's motivation, behind giving us this command. And uh, the, first, the first reason we find, or our f- first motivation to worship God, is in verses 5 through 7. And it's because of the good things that he had done for them. Worship me because of the good things he has, he ha- I have done for you, is what he's saying here. And so let's look at verse 5. And what he's going to do in verse 5, he's going to take them back to the origin of the Passover. He's going to take them back to why they're celebrating, why they're worshiping. A lot like we do very often at Christmas time or at Easter, right? We'll have a sermon teaching us or reminding us about the incarnation, right? Or about the, uh, the resurrection. Very similar thing. It's good to understand why they were celebrating this. And so he takes them back. Let's read it. He says, he made it a decree in Joseph. And I take Joseph there to be another name referring to Israel. I think he does this for literary reasons. Look at verse 4. He uses two different names for Israel, right? It is a statute for Israel, a rule of the God of Jacob. And then instead of going back to Israel, he uses Joseph's name instead of Jacob to represent Israel. Why would he pick Joseph? Because he's taking us back to Egypt, right? When they were in Egypt... Who was it that would have been known as their father to the Egyptians? I mean, who was, whose family was it? Whose people were they in Egypt? They were Joseph's people. He was the one that brought their entrance into Egypt. He was the ruler, um, you know, the ruler under Pharaoh of that nation. And so it immediately takes us back to that time when God's people were in Egypt when he says he made it a decree in Joseph. And then he says when he went out over the land of Egypt. I take that he to be referring to God, not Joseph. And by going out, it's not talking about 
when he led them out of Egypt, I don't think. I think it is talking about going out in judgment. When he went out in judgment. This is when he made it a decree, right? Look at the, that language. This is when he established the Passover. This is when he established it as an ordinance to be celebrated forever. It was when he went out over the land of Egypt in judgment and delivered his people with a, a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And so he brings them back to why. He brings them back to the beginnings of this celebration. And then there at the end of verse 5, you'll notice we get, we get something different. For the first time, we get like a part C to one of these verses, a third line to one of these verses. You see, this whole psalm, with the exception of three verses, is made up of Hebrew parallelism. That's the literary style. A parallelism is, is simply a verse that has a line, a first line, and then a second line that corresponds somehow to the first line. Right? Sometimes it corresponds by stating the same thing in different words. Sometimes it elaborates slightly. Sometimes it's antithetical. Sometimes it's the opposite. You know, the Proverbs are full of those, right? Contrasting the wise man and the foolish man. But in this one, we have some, most of them, the second line embellishes on or, or uh, elaborates on the first line. Just, just look at the verses so far. Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Right? You see the, how that parallelism works? Every verse. Raise a song, sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre with the harp. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon on our feast day. And then at verse 4, it's a statute for Israel, a rule of the God of Jacob. You see this parallelism over and over, and it's going to keep going all the way through verse 16. But there are three times where we have this break in the parallelism. We have this third line, and each time it's significant. And this time, it's something that's honestly different, difficult to interpret what exactly he means here. Uh, there's about a million different suggestions. Read it. It says, I hear a language I had not known. So every conceivable uh, different people group of hearing has been brought forth here. Is it Egypt hearing the voice of God? Is it God hearing the unknown voice of the Egyptians? Is it the Israelites hearing the unknown voice of the Egyptians? But lately, what most scholars have tended towards, and it makes the most sense to me, Although to know definitely, I think, is beyond our abilities right now and as far as knowing the Hebrew language. But it seems the most likely to me is that this is the author interjecting here. I hear a language I had not known, or I hear a voice I had not recognized. It could be translated. Or a saying I had not understood. And the reason that this is so significant is because it signifies a switch in the speaker. There's no longer going to be this narrator, this author, it says it's written by Asaph, who's leading out in this discourse. It's going to be God who takes up the discourse from this point on, starting in verse 6. And so this, this little interjection here in between verse 5 and verse 6, which is really more how I see it, it indicates that switch is going on. The author is saying, I heard, I heard a voice I had not known. I heard a language I had not understood. And then he presents God's message. And like I said, the rest of this passage is going to be God directly addressing his people. God himself giving them the reason for worshiping him. And the first thing he does there in verse 6 is he reminds his people of how he delivered them. He reminds them of how he delivered them, first of all, from a terrible social and economic situation. Look at verse 6 there. I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. Clearly, this is referring to the hard labor, the, the burden, the basket, the making of the bricks, the building of the monuments that the Egyptians had enforced God's people to do when they were under their control. They were in a position where just to live meant hard labor to a cruel master. Imagine that kind of lifestyle. Every day waking up to the whips of the Egyptians baking in the sun, doing their work, building monuments to their gods. He says, I delivered you from that. I took you out of that. I set you free. I took you away from slavery to that terrible master. I made you slaves to myself, the best master. He's reminding them of what he did for them when this celebration was inaugurated. What about verse 7? He goes on to give more of the things that he did for them. He says, in distress you called, and I delivered you. 
I think this is probably referring to the Exodus in general, probably the 10 plagues in general, right? They, his people, it says over and over in Exodus, I have heard their call. In distress, they were calling out. And he came. And like I said, with that mighty hand, with that outstretched arm, he showed the Egyptians who the real God was and whose people the Israelites really were. He delivered them from their enemies with death and fire and darkness. Putting his wrath on display, saving his people. He's reminding them of this. Call this to mind, he's saying, on your worship day. Call this to mind when you meet together to worship me. Remember why you're doing it. This is why I command it. This is why you should do it. The things I've done for you are no small things. They are amazing things. Unlike anyone has ever done, any God has ever done for a nation before. The earth had never seen anything like it. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. This may be talking about Mount Horeb, where the cloud with the thunder settled down and God spoke to Moses and his people. I think more likely he's still talking about that exodus process. I think more likely when he says, I answered you in the secret place of thunder, he's talking about when the Egyptians were there in front of the Red Sea. And the, I'm sorry, the Israelites and the Egyptians were bearing down on them to cut them off. And that pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and behind them. It said a pillar of cloud and darkness stayed between the Egyptians and the Israelites all night long. And it says they lit up the night. A storm was raging. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. And if that is indeed the event that it's being alluded to here, that's being referred to here, then we see already a hint of the direction to which this psalm is going because it's going in a direction you may not expect. Because how did the Israelites respond before God miraculously saved them with that cloud behind them and parting the Red Sea in front of them? They said, was there not enough graves in Egypt that you let us out here to die? Was there not enough graves in Egypt that you took us out here to die? After seeing all of that, all of those plagues, the Nile River run red with blood, darkness everywhere but on their one little Goshen, their one little town. After seeing all that, were there not enough graves in Egypt that you let us out here to die? And, and whether or not that's exactly what's being, that event is what's being alluded to here, which I think it is, the next line here, which once again is a break in the parallelism, it's, it's an additional line here. It's almost an addendum. It definitely sets that tone. It definitely calls that mistrust of the people to mind. God is bringing up that doubt, that failure of faith. Because what happened at Meribah? He says, I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Well, Meribah is a name given to two different locations. One kind of when they first went into the wilderness and one later on before they came out. But in both places, almost the exact same thing happened. You know the story, right? They ran out of water. They run out of water and they test the Lord. They put him to the test, but not by faith, not by saying, God, we're out of water, but you know what? We've seen you do things that you know, defy all logic, defy all nature, defy anything human beings can imagine. There is no doubt you'll come through, but Lord, we're crying out to you and asking you to come through. That would be one way of putting him to the test. That's not what he means. No, they put him to the test. Exodus 17, 7 says they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? They questioned if he was even with them anymore. God, are you even here? Do you even care? We're thirsty here. We need water. Not, even, not considering that God knows they need water. God knows they need water. Why would he bring them out from Egypt to kill them in the wilderness? It makes no sense. And yet God still provided. Even when they doubted, even when they put him to test by doubting, Moses struck the rock and water gushed out. And he filled their mouths and he quenched their thirst. 
even when they didn't believe, when he had every right to let them go thirsty. What a powerful case God is making for worshiping him on this day. Wouldn't you agree? What a powerful case. He's saying, I led you out when you were slaves. I delivered you from armies. And then even when you turned your back on me, I provided for you. Is that not enough reason to celebrate, to worship me, to trust in me? Have I proven your tr- that you can trust me yet? Have I proven that you can trust me yet, Israel? And in verse 8, we see God's desire for his people to respond rightly in light of those mercies. Look at him express his earnest desire that they would consider those things and respond by trusting in him and worshiping him. He says, hear all my people while I admonish you. O Israel, if you would but listen to me. And then what would a right response look like? That's verses 9 and 10. He begs for them to respond rightly to that, to his past dealings with them And then he shows them what a right response would look like. Verses 9 and 10. There shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to to a foreign God. Here's what a right response to that kind of love and faithfulness and provision would look like. Rejecting all idols. That's a good start. When you've got a God like that on your side, throw away all the little guys. Throw away the gods that were crushed in Egypt. Throw away the gods that would later be crushed as they entered the promised land. Why would you turn to those gods? He's only calling them to do what's reasonable here. And notice how he says, there shall be no strange God among you. What was it that the Israelites questioned in Exodus 17, 7? Is the Lord among us? And here we see the link. The link between mistrust and idolatry. Right? Why does God bring up this specific command here in verse 9? Some people say it's a summary of the whole law, right? Because the first and second commandments speak to this. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make a graven image. So he just summarizes here as a representative of the law. Keep my law. I think it's more than that. I think he's bringing out this relationship between mistrust and idolatry. You see, when you don't believe God is among you, then is when you go and get gods to be among you. When you don't believe that God is going to meet every need and desire that he has placed within your heart, then you go looking for others to fulfill those desires and to meet those needs. And so even though at the waters of the Red Sea and at the lack of waters in the, de- in the wilderness at Meribah, their doubt expressed itself in these grumblings. Later on, that same doubt was going to express itself in idolatry. And so he connects these things. He He says, trust me, and therefore, turn aside from these. Believe me, and therefore, don't come over here where you will find nothing. Very much like he says, quit hewing uh, elsewhere. Quit hewing for yourself broken cisterns. You You have the fountain right here. Why would you turn to these? What else would a right response look like? Verse 10, it looks like recognizing their unique relationship with Yahweh. I am, he says, I am Yahweh, your God. I am your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. This is my claim to you. Can a nation be born in a day? You were. I birthed you in one day. I made you mine. This is my claim over you. I am your God. You have a unique relationship to me. Remember it. Recognize it. And what, is the, what would the result of that be? Once again, we have here the third break in this parallelism, this addition to this verse. It is that we would trust in him alone for provision and for protection and to meet every need and godly desire within our hearts. That's the essence of this psalm. That's the essence of this statement here at the end of verse 10. And I believe this statement is the central theme of this psalm. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Why? Why is this the central statement? Not just because it occupies the the final sort of break from his poetic style. 
but because it is in itself the theme. What does he mean when he says, open your mouth wide and I will fill it up? He means pursue me alone as the source of your protection, your needs, your desires, all good things. And I will so far exceed every expectation and need that you come with to me, that you seek from me, from my hand. You see, the image is of putting food in the mouth. Like a, like a mother feeds her baby. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it up. He's saying, I will feed you. I will take care of you. Spurgeon used the example of a baby bird and a mother bird. The way it just trusts its mother and opens its mouth wide to receive what it needs from its mother's mouth. This is what God is saying to them. This is what God says to us. Open your mouth wide. I will fill it up. And not only that, this stands at the center of the chiastic structure of this whole discourse. And this is, this is pretty interesting. Stick with me here. A chiasm, was a, if you don't know, is a Hebrew literary device. And what they would do is a poetic, a poetic way that they would write. They would mention something. You could call it point A. Then they would mention another idea maybe or a, or a noun or something. And then perhaps, and that's B. And then they would repeat it in reverse order. That's a chiasm. So you'd have thought A, thought B, thought B, thought A. We see a great example of this, a one-verse chiasm in verse 16. It's the only one-verse chiasm in this psalm. The rest are, are, are different. He says, it says, but he would feed you. Okay, so that's thought one. He would feed you, or thought A, with the finest of the wheat. That's thought B. Now look at the second part of that parallel, uh, the parallel part of that verse. And with honey from the rock, well, what does that correspond to? It corresponds to the wheat, right? The honey from the rock corresponds with the finest of the wheat. So we see, I will feed you with the wheat, and with the honey, I will satisfy you. And that corresponds to feeding, right? This is a chiasm. And sometimes you get these chiasms that take up whole discourses or passages. And when you do, almost in every case, it is the middle Section, the middle thought of that chiasm that is being highlighted, set before us as the central statement of that discourse. There's a great example of this uh, in the Tower of Babel narrative. There's a lot of these debated in, in, the, in the Hebrew scriptures, but one that's usually almost always recognized is in the Tower of Babel. It talks about how the people, and th this is not going to be in the right order, but how the people of the land had disobeyed God by settling in one place. They had one language. They were going to build a tower to exalt themselves. And then there's this middle statement. It says, God came down, and everything went in reverse. All of their plans were frustrated. God comes down. The language is confused. The city, they leave off building the city, and they're scattered over the face of the earth. And so it builds up with their intentions. God comes down and sets everything back in reverse. This is a chiasm. And we have this exact thing, I, I believe, clearly laid out in this psalm. And the middle statement, the central theme is right here. God is calling on his people. Open your mouth wide. I will fill it up. And so let's take a look quickly. We're going to move even uh, faster through the second part of this and see how this matches up. In verses, 11, in verses 9 and 10, we saw what a right response to God would look like. In verses 11 and 12, we see the people refuse that right response. Right in verse 10, he said, you need to recognize your unique relationship with Yahweh, with me. In verse 11, they refused to recognize it. My people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. And then in verse 12, we see it corresponding with verse 9. Where, wherever he said to turn away from idols, right? Reject all idols. What does God do? It says in verse 12, he gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. In the context, what does that mean? What is he talking about here? Abandoning him and the worship and trust of him and pursuing those idols that he had forbidden. And so they reject God. Uh, they reject God. They recognize and pursue these idols. God gives them over to it. Then in verse, th verse 13, we see an almost exact same statement as we have in verse 8. 
right? In verse eight, hear, O my people, will I admonish you. O Israel, if you would but listen to me. He was exhorting them how to respond rightly in light of the things that he had done for them in the past. But here in verse 13, we have the same words almost. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. But this time, it's going to be in light of what he wants to do for them in the future. And that's what contrasts with verses 5 through 7, what he wants to do. In verses 14 through 16, we find it. Look at those. They went from a terrible situation I'm sorry, uh, they went from being uh, uh, delivered from their enemies in verse 7 to now in the corresponding verse 14 and 15, he says, you will have even more. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe toward him and their fate would last forever. You wouldn't have just a temporary deliverance. You wouldn't have just one victory. I would bring your enemies to their knees in front of me. I would bring them into the temple to bow down in defeat if you would just trust in me. And it would last forever. Their fate would last forever. He's saying you can have what you've had, you can have more. You can have it in abundance if you will not turn your back to me. What about verse 16? Look at the opposite of that terrible situation that he delivered them from in Egypt. He's saying, not only that, but I would feed you with the finest of the wheat and with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. I will abundantly provide for your every need and desire. Open up your mouth wide and I will fill it up. So God didn't just command his worship on the basis of past blessings, but in order to ensure future blessings. And so when you combine both of those reasons together, you get this unifying message that they should worship and trust God alone because his past protection and provision guarantees that it will continue into the future. Look at all that I have done and know that I will never leave you or forsake you. Worship me. Trust in me alone in light of what I've done and so that I would always be able to pour out the same kind of favor and blessing upon you. In other words, the motive behind God's command is for their good. It's not just a demand to lift him up because he deserves it. It's the very best Thing they could do is remember him, trust in him, and worship him. So that they could always remain in that relationship with him as a nation. It's for your good, he says. Here's what I want to do for you. It's what they failed to recognize, the generation that came out of Egypt. And it's what God was hoping this generation who received this psalm and those who would sing this psalm would recognize. It's what he hopes that we will recognize and understand. Do you believe this? Do you believe when the scripture says the young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord have no lack, they lack no good thing. You believe that he is a rewarder of those who seek him and thus draw near to him. Do you have a reason? Do you have a reason to believe it? Like the Israelites had a reason. Has he done great things for you? Like he did great things for them. I mean, I I preach this all the time. I love coming back to the, you know, the, the argument of comparing, right? The two different miracles, the two different deliverances and salvation. I think we're intended to. If that physical deliverance was worthy of them being his forever, And I know that along with that came the fact that he was their God and that was the greatest blessing of it. But still, think of the final salvation that he's done in our case. It does not even compare. Right? You're talking about a terrible, you want to talk about a terrible situation. Okay? Think of what you were. Think of where you were. Think of how the Bible describes man in his lost condition. 
It's not a pretty picture. You want to talk about being slave to Pharaoh? Try being a slave to Satan. You want to talk about being a, a slave to the, the bondage of the Egyptians? What about a slave to the bondage of sin? God delivering from a physical army, that's something, that's amazing. God delivering you from the hounds of hell is even more. There is no comparison. What he's done for us so far exceeds it. How much more then ought our response to be? Has he promised us even greater blessing to come? Does he want to continue in that course? Will he continue in that course? Right? I mean, think about the course laid out there in Romans 8. He's called, right? He's justified. If he's justified, he's sanctified. If he's sanctified, he's glorified. What's entailed in that? The consummation, the finishing, the realization of everything that's begun on this earth, right? We've begun to live lives without, without sin, right? We've begun. We haven't fully realized that. You'll have it realized. We've begun to pursue a relationship with God. Isn't this the greatest thing of all? Fully realized. Don't you get frustrated when you're praying, when you're reading your Bible, no matter what you're doing, when you're sitting in church and, and you, your heart wants to like commune with God and, and be totally enraptured in what's going on and in your time with him and you find yourself distracted or, or you, you find yourself uh, sinfully distracted. Maybe you're just getting bored. Maybe you just don't know what to say. I mean, our relationship with God is a struggle. Am I the only one? I struggle. All of those hindrances taken away. Perfect communion. And we grow in that relationship here on this earth as well. I don't want to make it seem like all of his promises are for the day of his return or the day we die. We grow in grace and joy every day. He's promised us. He wants to do more for us. Has he tested us? He's tested us thousands of times. He tests us every single day. Day. Think about this with me. What was it about that situation at Meribah that tested God's people? Was it not that what they saw with their eyes contradicted, let me rephrase that, seemed to contradict God's declaration of goodwill towards them? Would you, would you agree that's what was going on? What they were perceiving from a physical, material standpoint seemed to contradict God's declaration that he would always take care of them, that he would be their God, that he would provide for them, lead them into the promised land. It's, I mean, I, it would seem that way. If you're starving, you know, if you're, oh, I guess they had manna, but if you're thirsty, there's no water. Numbers 24 and 5, here's what they said. Here's the reason they give. Why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us out of this, uh, to bring us to this evil place? It's no place for grain or figs, or vines, or pomegranates? Why do they bring those things up? Because that's the way that the new, that the Canaan was described to them, right? Uh, God, I don't see any figs yet. I don't see that land flowing with milk and honey. I don't see pomegranate. I just see wilderness, and I'm thirsty. And there is no water to drink. And do you realize every trial entering your life, everyone, no matter how big and tragic, no matter how small and trivial, it's a test of your confidence in God's goodwill towards you. In God's declaration, open up your mouth wide and I will fill it up. In God's promise to keep you, to never leave you or forsake you, who are you going to believe? Are you going to walk by faith or are you going to walk by sight? And I know that we know this intellectually. The problem is so often our hearts are unconvinced of it. We do the exact same thing that the Israelites did. We forget the past. We forget somehow the grace that has already been shown to us. We, or, or we forget to apply it to what that surely must mean for our future. We don't work out the implications of it. We don't do what Paul did in Romans 8. He who did not spare his only son, but gave him up for us all. What's the implications of that? Will he not willingly give us all things? Of course. We're not following the grace that's been shown to us to its natural implication, its logical implication. We either lose sight of that past grace, or we, we 
maybe become proud, don't see it as that big of a deal, don't see our, our salvation anymore as that astounding. And if our salvation wasn't astounding, then why should we think God is going to work wonders in our situation today? Why should we think he's committed to us today if he didn't commit much to us in the past? But he did. And so we doubt his goodwill. We doubt his generosity. Is God a miser? Man, are there generous people? Think of the most generous person you know. They don't compare with God. Man, I can think of some incredibly generous people right here in this congregation. Is God stingy? Does he want to withhold graces from you? Does he want to withhold joy from you? Does he want to withhold a relationship, a stronger relationship? Does he want to withhold anything that would be good for you? Why would he want to do that? Why would he withhold good from his children? Would you withhold good from your children if it was in your power to do it? Then we must know that that situation we face somehow in the counsels of God that we will never understand many, of the t- many times, somehow he is working it for your good. I know that's not what the situation seems to say. Who will you believe? We must be convinced of it in our very being. No matter what, no matter what I face, he loves me. He's proved it on the cross. He loves me. Why would he abandon me now? Instead, so often we feel a need or a desire, and we worry that he won't meet it. And so we seek its fulfillment in other places. This is how we run after idols in our own heart. We pursue things more than God in our own heart. We look to other things to take care of us because we fear that if we just trust in him and follow him and obey him, we won't get everything we want and need. We feel a desire to be loved. So we idolize human relationships. We fear that we won't get that love from God. And so we pursue a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a spouse or we pursue a friendship, acceptance, popularity more than we pursue him. Seeking to meet that desire in the wrong places, empty, broken cisterns. We feel a desire for joy and pleasure, right? So every time we get a free moment, we turn on the television or we turn on a movie or we turn on the radio or we fire up social media or maybe even worse, we turn to some kind of sinful promise of pleasure. We do want joy. We want pleasure. We don't look for it in God so often. We feel a desire to be safe and comfortable. And so we put that above faithfulness to God and we shrink back from sharing our faith. It's scary. It could be uncomfortable. We shrink back from serving the church and our brethren We shrink back from sacrificially pursuing God, scared to invest too much in him to the detriment of our comfort. We feel a desire for fulfillment and purpose, so we base our identity so often in our jobs or in our performance, maybe at school, maybe our hobbies, maybe a relationship, a social standing. We desire riches and power, so we become slaves to our job. We fear to give generously, lest we might actually be losing. God allows us to do this, but it grieves him, just like we see in verses 8 and 13. Oh, Israel, if you would but listen to me. Oh, that my people would listen to me. It grieves him because he knows those things will never work. They'll never satisfy. And even if they seem to satisfy for a moment, they will leave you empty and broken. You will come to the end of your life having pursued anything in the place of God and be left with nothing forever. That's why it grieves him. It's not just because he wants to worship. Yes, he deserves worship. Yes, he desires worship. 
but he sees where it's leading. Oh, that my people Israel would listen to me, what I would do to them. All the while, he's crying out, look, open up your mouth wide to me. I will fill it up. I will fill it up. All the while, he's saying, you desire to be loved? Open up your mouth wide to me. I will fill it up. I will teach you to know what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. Pursue love in me. You'll find it. You desire joy and pleasure? Open up your mouth wide and fill it up. I want to give you joy and pleasure. I'm not here to hold that back from you. In my presence, there is fullness of joy. At my right hand are pleasures forevermore. Seek pleasure in me. You'll find it. You desire safety and comfort? Open up your mouth wide. I'll fill it up. Not with the kind of safety and comfort maybe that you're wanting in your sinfulness to be just comfortable here on this earth in our inability to look to the future. Often that's what we desire. I'm talking about an eternal safety. I'm talking about after the tribulations of this world are over, being received into mansions of splendor, that kind of comfort. And even on this earth, even on this earth, he says, when you pass through the waters, what? I will be with you. Even in the tribulations of this world, I'm going to give you comfort. You'll find comfort in me. I will be with you. The floods will not harm you. They will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flame shall not consume you. You desire fulfillment and purpose, seek it in me. Open your mouth wide. I will fill it up. I will make you an ambassador of the king. I will make you my representative to the peoples of this earth. I will give you more purpose than you know what to do with or could ever fulfill. I will show you the reason why you were born. You will only ever fulfill your purpose if you seek it in me. You desire riches and power? Seek it in me. Oh, not the kind that sinful man wants. No, no, the very riches and power of God at work in us. That's what he offers. I will show you the riches of my glorious inheritance. I will show you the immeasurable greatness of my power towards those who believe. Oh, you won't get to boast in any riches or power of your own, but you can have a full share in my own. I want to seat you on a throne next to me. I want to exalt you. He's so generous. And so to sum it up, the message of this both to them and to us, I think we could use Malachi 3.10. God says, put me to the test. Put me to the test but not in the sinful way the Egyptians did at Meribah. Put me to the test in this way, that you would become so invested in your pursuit of me that if my promises don't come through, you're completely undone. Be so invested in me. Be so hanging upon my every promise. Be so invested in my promises And every word that has come out of my mouth, that if I don't come through, you're totally undone. Put me to the test. I'm saying open up your mouth wide. I will fill it up. Put me to the test. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down a blessing until there is no more need. If we're not experiencing these things, if we're not experiencing that love that surpasses knowledge in our relationship with Christ, if we're not experiencing joy and pleasure 
that is found at his right hand. If we're not experiencing right, all these things, this safety, the comfort of knowing that he is with us always. right? If we're not experiencing that daily purpose that makes us spring out of bed, knowing that we have a great work to do that day, every day. If we're not experiencing these things in our lives, the riches, a greater understanding of the riches that we have in Christ and of the power that is at work in us, if we're not experiencing these things, it's not because of him. The fault does not lay with him. It's not as if he's unable. He's able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. It's not because he's not willing. Right? Will he not graciously give us all things? The fault is with us. It's that we are not pursuing these things in him. We either are either not opening our mouths to him, but opening our mouths, expecting to receive these things elsewhere, or else it's because we're not opening wide enough. Maybe we trust him just a little. I'll invest in your promises a little bit, God. I'll stake my life on your word a little bit, God. I'll pursue you a little bit, God. When we worship him a little, when we trust him a little, when we seek him a little, it's because we expect little from him. You can be sure of that. But here he stands saying, seek to have all your needs and desires abundantly fulfilled in me and you will not be disappointed. That's his promise to you tonight. Will you take him on that word? Will you put him to the test? Let's close with these by praying together these words from a song by Ross King. So I'm going to lead us in prayer. I'm just using his, his song as a script because I think it's a beautiful prayer. He says, I have bowed at the altar. Lord, we come before you admitting that we have bowed at the altar of the world. I know I have so many times. We have wasted affections, God, on the things that you despise. But we long to return to you. You alone, God, can satisfy. You are the treasure that I've found. God, you are the meaning of life. You are my deepest desires fulfilled. You alone can satisfy. God, you are my bread of life. Lord, you are our provider. You fill our soul with living water and beneath your wing. There's a shelter where I hide. God, you alone can satisfy. In Jesus' name, amen.